the date was April 16, 2005, a night that began like any other in Providence, Rhode Island. Families tucked into dinner, friends met for drinks, and night owls wandered the streets of this New England town. But evil forces were at play to violently shatter the peace. By dawn, Providence would be rocked by a horrific murder that no one saw coming. Our tragic story begins with Esteban Carpio, a 26-year-old father of two young children. Carpio had a lengthy rap sheet of petty crimes and violent outbursts. In the weeks prior, those close to him noticed increasingly abnormal behavior. Carpio started to feel very scared and thought that he was hearing voices. He believed that bad spirits were trying to harm him. His girlfriend shared with the police that he talked a lot about being cursed by someone using voodoo, a type of magic. To try to keep the evil away, Carpio wore a special cord around his waist that he believed had been blessed to protect him. His family was really worried and tried hard to find him help for his mental health, but it seemed like nothing was making a difference. On that fateful April night, Esteban Carpio left his home driving a rented red minivan. Earlier, he had dropped his girlfriend downtown for a job interview, promising to pick her up afterwards. She called repeatedly as the hours passed with no sign of Carpio. As Carpio drove through the east side just after 9 p.m., he spotted 84-year-old Madeline Gatta standing alone in her driveway. A vulnerable elderly woman alone at night was too tempting a target for the disturbed Carpio to resist. Pulling his minivan to the curb half a block away, Carpio reached for a hat and scarf under his seat. He covered his face until just his eyes were visible. Carpio then grabbed a large hunting knife and slipped it into his jacket pocket. Carpio walked quickly up the sidewalk toward Madeline, pace accelerating with violent intent. The elderly woman began screaming as the sinister figure rushed towards her, but it was too late. Carpio forcefully plunged the blade deep into Madeline's upper back. She fell to the ground, crying loudly because of the pain. The neighbors, hearing her scream, quickly left their houses. At that moment, Carpio ran back to his minivan, which was still running. He got in quickly, pressed the accelerator, and drove away fast into the night. This left Madeline hurt and bleeding on the road. However, a smart person nearby quickly wrote down the van's license plate number as it sped away. Carpio then went to get his girlfriend, acting like everything was normal. She didn't know that something bad had already happened that night. The police were fast to find the strange van using the license plate number the witness gave them. Only an hour after the awful attack, the police were all around Carpio's house ready to catch him. His girlfriend, who seemed a bit unsure, finally helped to get him to come outside. Detectives James Allen and John McGeehan transported Carpio to police headquarters for intense questioning. The seasoned homicide detectives brought the suspect to an interrogation room on the third floor. In the beginning, Carpio was pretty calm and gave a fake name. Rosalino Carr. He told the police that he didn't know anything about the stabbing, but when the police started to show him more and more proof, his attitude changed. For about 20 stressful minutes, the two detectives talked with Carpio. Then Detective McGeehan decided to get Carpio a glass of water, leaving him alone with Detective Allen for a short time. As soon as Detective McGeehan left the room, there was a sudden and violent noise and commotion inside. McGeehan really wanted to get back into the room and tried hard to open the door, but it was locked from the inside. All the while, he could hear Carpio shouting. He banged on the door loudly, asking to be let back in, but Carpio didn't answer him, kicking violently at the locked door. Then came Alan's muffled cry for help. He's got my gun. He's going to kill me. The officers battered down the door, but it was too late. Detective Allen laid crumbled on the floor, shot twice in the chest at point-blank range with his own service revolver. Carpio had overpowered the veteran detective and stolen his weapon during the brief moment McGeehan stepped out. After shooting Allen execution style twice in the chest, Carpio fired a third shot into a nearby window. He leapt through the shattered glass into the rainy night three stories down. Landing hard on the concrete below, Carpio was severely injured, but adrenaline pushed him to his feet. Inside, officers burst into the room to find Allen bleeding out from two gunshots to the chest. His revolver lays next to him on the floor. Desperate efforts were made to save Allen's life, but he tragically succumbed to his wounds early the next morning. Providence police launched a massive manhunt for cop killer Esteban Carpio, now on the run injured and desperate somewhere in the city. 
Carpio attempted to contact an acquaintance requesting they drive him out of state. Only one hour after the shooting happened, a special police team called SWAT quickly surrounded a house close to the station where they found Carpio hiding. Carpio fought back very hard when they tried to arrest him. In the end, the police were able to get control over him after using tasers, a type of weapon that can temporarily stop someone by shocking them with electricity, and after a physical fight. In custody at last, Carpio was taken to the hospital to treat wounds from his three-story leap and intense apprehension. His face was severely swollen and bruised, with broken bones and bloody gashes. A few days later, during his court hearing, the police made Carpio wear a special mask. They said it was to stop him from possibly spitting at the officers, which could spread germs and make people sick. However, Carpio's family thought the police were actually trying to hide something. They believed that the police had beaten Carpio up as revenge, and they were using the mask to cover up his injuries. An FBI civil rights investigation was launched into the use of force during Carpio's arrest. They determined his extensive injuries were sustained in the fall and violent struggle with police required to take him into custody. No officers would face disciplinary action. As the city of Providence grieved for Detective James Allen, a well-respected officer, Carpio was in jail without bail, facing charges for first-degree murder. In June 2006, his important trial started in Superior Court to decide what would happen to him. Prosecutors portrayed Carpio as a ruthless killer who murdered a cop in cold blood to evade justice for stabbing an innocent elderly woman. Their witnesses vividly recounted the chilling events. The defense did not dispute Carpio fatally shot Allen, but his lawyer argued Carpio was insane at the time and unable to control his disturbed mind. Family and psychiatrists testified to his severe mental illness. However, prosecution psychiatrists strongly contested Carpio met Rhode Island's strict legal definition of madness. After two emotional weeks, the case went to the jury for a verdict. The jury deliberated for three tense days before returning their decision, guilty on all counts. Carpio lowered his head as the Allen family wept with relief that justice had been served. At his sentencing, Carpio made a tearful statement apologizing to Allen's family and the community. Every day, I face the facts of what I did and what happened. But the judge showed no mercy, citing Carpio's extensive criminal past and handing down the maximum punishment. Life behind bars without parole. Hundreds lined the streets to bid a final farewell to Detective James Allen, a beloved hero to all who knew him. The 55-year-old father of three was laid to rest with full police honors after bravely serving Providence for over 25 years. For Esteban Carpio, his cold-blooded actions earned him a permanent place in a prison cell until the day he dies. Cut off from society like a bad memory Rhode Island would soon forget.